thank you so very much and let me let me thank you as well as apologize at the same time because <laughs> which is throwing in the question and you happen to be the first uh, speaker to be answering it while the other speakers get time to you know decide what they have to say so mr anurag uh, the question is what according to you is the number one skill required in order to succeed the only reason i ask is because i really really need it in the modern world like very simply i would say it uh, should be finance and it both fantastic 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 answer uh, moving on to our next speaker we've got uh, mr wilbertus darmadi cio toyota astra motor mr darmadi what would your answer be anything not just it it could be life in general hello Yes, yes. Sir. Can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat again? Question, sorry. Sir, the question is, what according to you, with your vast experience in life and working and all of that, what would you say is the number one skill required to succeed in life? Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. but from my uh, experience i think uh, the first important things is uh, you are courage you are willingness yeah why because if you have a courage and willingness you can if you don't have uh, enough skill or knowledge but you have a courage you have a re- willingness to learn yeah so you will start to study to learn something yeah and from that of course Uh, as expert you are i think the money will come yeah <laughs> so, i am really happy I, to hear that <laughs> courage i have plenty skills not so many but yes courage is fantastic uh, happy to hear sir thank you so very much and of course the next speaker is mr karunanand menon general principal solution engineer okta mr menon what would your answer be hi nikita Hello. yeah i think uh, uh, probably i would look at you know uh, make sure that we enjoy what we do so you know there has to be passion attached to it as long as that is there everything else will follow i think passion and you know drive towards what you like is i think important great great and on that positive note gentlemen stage is all yours thank you so much thank you hi everyone uh, thank you for attending and i i thank the uh, you know the the the, the people who organized this uh, uh, for us to take part in this like uh, for the opportunity and uh, i would like to as the moderator first i would like to introduce to the gentleman because i am to be very frank i am from the manufacturing sector so more technical to to more technical people uh, we are with us uh, with us today so i would like to introduce two gentlemen with us uh, before we step into our q and a session in this uh, fireside chat so uh, with us is will uh, mr wilbertus darmadi he is the ceo of toyota astra motor and he has 25 years experience in uh, it profession especially in automotive industry so having this broad experience in it uh, and several technical it skills he was an engineer before he came up as the cio uh, working with a ma- lot of multinational stakeholders uh, he's helping the company to boost its performance using the latest technology such as iot smart data utilization it is etc so mr darmad is uh, actively involved in indonesia cio community so as a result he is regularly invited to give uh, his insights in lot of uh, it uh, related uh, uh, you know gatherings or you know summits something like that so uh, and the next uh, speaker is mr karunanand menan he's uh, i will call him as karun he's a he's a veteran in the software industry and he's been working in application security and identity access management since 2002 like 20 years now and 
he has worked in range of capacities from application development to domain consultancy. And his previous roles uh, were with Forge Rock as principal solutions architect, Vipro and Oracle. Uh, he has worked in a lot of countries uh, from Middle East to uh, Australia during his 20 year career. And he has worked in product princi principal companies as and system in integration companies in this uh, IT space. And he has spoken and participated in numerous security events and presented identity management to both business audience and technical communities. His current re responsibility at Okta is to grow the Asia business as a senior sales engineer to delight the customers with uh, Okta's uh, workforce and the customer identity solutions. Uh, something personal about Karun, he lives in Singapore with his wife and two daughters. And also he loves traveling and listening to all kinds of music, like uh, let's say Indian uh, music from A.R. Rahman to Dr. Dre whatever you name it he's a fan of all the music and last uh, to introduce me i'm i'm from the manufacturing industry and i have a lot of exposure to it and i have been in uh, some projects related to erp implementation and uh, so on and so forth and also today we are talking about the cyber risk and adoption of cyber uh, cloud technology uh, in the manufacturing industry. So in my perspective, uh, cloud technology is nothing, you know, uh, you don't have to be afraid of that. Day-to-day -day life, we are using it unknowingly. Maybe some people know, maybe some people don't know, like we are using Gmail, right? So in this uh, era, uh, moving on to cloud is nothing to be afraid of, but most of our, you know, middle level and the staff level, they think uh, moving on to the cloud and, you know, changing the working way to go with the technology is something so difficult. First, we have to change that perspective. From that onwards, I think uh, we can go a long way. So I'm not going to take much time of yours and I'm going to present my first question to Mr. Dalmadi. Uh, my question would be, what would you say uh, some of the major concern when it comes to the adoption of cloud technology? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Anaruda. Yeah. So uh, like you mentioned that uh, currently actually in our daily life, yeah, uh, we already utilize the cloud, yeah. Like you mentioned about Gmail, yeah. actually that's the cloud technology, yeah. So now uh, I will use uh, the words uh, undeniable. Yeah, I use that words undeniable. Cloud is something that uh, we cannot deny. Yeah. So for enterprise, yeah, for the uh, big company, I think, yeah. Sometimes, uh, yes. For example, you mentioned until now we don't have a uh, uh, urgency to go to the cloud. Yes, yeah. But from my experience, I think sometimes at least, yeah, you will go to the cloud. Yeah. So what is the issue here? Yeah? There are two things I think, yeah. Uh, if we are talking about the moving to the cloud. Yeah. First, security. Yeah. The second is about the privacy or confidentiality. Yeah, that's two items actually become the most concerned from all the people from the enterprise where they are thinking to move to the cloud. Yeah, security and uh, privacy or data confidentiality. Yeah, that's the major things. Yeah, the others, for example, uh, cloud cost management, how we control our resources on. Uh, the months and else, yes, but uh, I think the two items that I mentioned previously is become the uh, most uh, biggest concern from uh, everybody uh, when they are thinking to move to the cloud security and data uh, confidentiality. Yeah? So, why that's uh, become the first uh, concern here, yeah, the security? Yeah? 
uh, if we are moving to the cloud, it looks like that uh, you put your data in a new home, a new host that actually you don't know what exactly inside it. Yeah? So uh, you need to ensure how secure actually yeah, the host, the home that uh, you, we need to recite all our apps, our data inside it. So what, that's why security become the, the first concern. And we know that, yes, uh, there, there are many cloud providers now. Yeah? Uh, uh, I don't mention about the top, uh, top three big uh, cloud provider, yeah? but usually what they provide is yeah, they come to us, what they sell is uh, the, they uh, all related to the cloud. Yeah. But did you ever uh, have an experience that they come to you, they are not only offer your the cloud, but also the security? I don't think so, yeah? I don't think so. <laughs> because what when they come to the customer, what they're trying to offer actually is how the customer can uh, recite, put all the data in their cloud. Yeah? But they are never talk about how to secure it. Yeah, that's uh, the phenomenon, I think. Yeah. So that's why uh, we need separate party yeah, to ensure your security uh, in the cloud. So that's, uh, I think, to concern my security and data confidentiality. That's Anuruddha, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And it was very short, but informative. I think everybody understood what uh, what he meant by his uh, very brief and informative answer. Now, I would like to move on to Karun to this uh, present my next question. Like uh, when you transit your data to a cloud, of course, you, you, are, you are working with a vendor and you are, you are transferring your you know the data or file system or whatever so in this process how do we overcome losing the visibility and the control when uh, during the phase of transition of assets and operation to the cloud so could you enlighten us with your uh, expert idea on that sure sure mr Andrada. so i think uh, just to take a cue on what uh, park damadi mentioned right so uh, i think really the uh, the 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 fact is that we are for sure moving to the cloud uh, it's it's undeniable and uh, uh, why uh, we are incentivized to move to the cloud there are two aspects to it right one is the, the availability of resources for you to innovate at scale that's what cloud is bringing you on the table uh, which typically would mean that you are actually putting some of your ip uh, you know, intellectual property and stuff like that, uh, essentially on the cloud, maybe right. So that that that's one implication of security because you know you're you're wanting to innovate. So that means your innovation is your IP, right? So you're actually dragging some of that uh, to cloud environments, uh, for example. Uh, the other is really uh, as we all kind of uh, you know felt through the COVID. A period is that a sudden change or agility within the IT operating environment uh, for you know just being productive uh, is what is leading us to go to cloud. I mean that undeniably we can say now that without SaaS and all these productivity tools like Zoom, we, we would have been like hitting a wall when when COVID really hit us, right? So uh, we we learned from there that we could actually move on and you know uh, provide that environment of work for you anywhere. Uh, any time, right? So that that was one of the key things as well. So that brings some of what uh, Pak Damadi mentioned. There's around uh, confidentiality, privacy of the user themselves or the data of the customer uh, themselves. That that mostly is regulated through compliances as well. You know, in different countries, they have different regulations uh, to sort of uh, manage that. Uh, so if you bring all these together, uh, what we are really looking at is. Uh, have a first an approach to look at, uh, uh, you know, where is your data going to, right? So are you investing on infrastructure as a service and just running compute and, you know, um, uh, running your payloads or are you looking at 
uh, more of uh, looking at uh, you know SaaS subscriptions and adopting to SaaS ready-made uh, services, uh, so on and so forth, right? So you have to kind of keep track of where your data is going and what is the real purpose of sending that data, right? Are you delivering value in first of all sending that data, and if if it is delivering value, how are we now securing it? So I think that that's where the, it actually boils down to. Now a couple of points I could think of, right? One is uh, in a purely on-premise mechanism, especially in manufacturing sector, I would say there is largely IT and OT space. And OT is where you know, you're seeing that the progression to IoT industry 4.0 and so on and so forth, right? So that's, that's happening on the OT space. Uh, so there is cloud adoption. You know, there are big vendors who are providing IoT cloud and you know, getting you to work with those IoT clouds, especially instrumentation and uh, all of that. On the other hand, uh, uh, you see the IT space where you know it was just about you know connecting to your office space, working. So we all had a control from a perimeter point of view uh, in a traditional OT in a traditional IT space where you could ask people to come in within the firewall, do things, and then you know that way you had control. Even if you had provision slightly more access than required for a user, we were sure that he's in a premise within an office, within a constructs of a VPN at least, right, to, to come and work. Uh, what has vanished over that period when you move to cloud is really that perimeter in the first place. So, you know, you don't have a strict perimeter, so to speak, to monitor and keep everything under, under the, you know, lock and keys. So that is one area which is, you know, uh, knowing at least who has access to what kind of data and how critical that access is. What is the mitigation step, right? And uh, how do you mitigate that risk around somebody getting access to that data? So we are, we are seeing from my uh, experience point of view, I speak to a lot of customers where, you know, a lot of customers are embarking on uh, concepts like zero trust, for example, right? So where, where you're looking at a multi-domain approach to tackle security, you have to think about a data security strategy, you're thinking about uh, uh, people as a strategy. So you have to really look at how somebody is accessing application, what purpose they need. Uh, uh, is he given uh, minimal privilege or you know just the privilege required or more? Uh, we need to look at that. We need to look at a device strategy because you know everybody's like, especially during COVID, we started using personal laptops for work uh, as an example, right? So what degree of data you want them to uh, get hold of when they are coming from a personal laptop as opposed to uh, a corporate managed, you know, company laptop or a device, right? So we, we need to look at it from a device strategy standpoint, from uh, uh, logging and monitoring is even more critical, right? Who is doing what in which system? So that, that basically brings this whole SIEM space and the XDR space, which is around, you know, monitoring uh, uh, what's going uh, on on these SaaS applications or your cloud payloads. So I think uh, from a, as a base premise, I think everybody is gearing up towards building those uh, so-called building blocks, right? Like, you know, you, ha you have to have a, 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 log a good logging monitoring strategy, audit strategy. You should have a device strategy. You should have an identity strategy, for example, because, you know, Ultimately, uh, in the user front, everybody is accessing uh, some resource through a device. So there's always somebody in the end and there is a device through which they're coming in. So all these strategies pile up to kind of give that, uh, you know, larger view or visibility uh, for the organization. Uh, some uh, customers and some organizations do have some of these basic uh, pieces built uh, because of their you know, existing way of work, or maybe sometimes because of compliance uh, regulations driving them to actually do it. So like, for example, monitoring and auditing, I think that's something that's mostly widely uh, kind of already put in place in some shape or form, right? But uh, where it is going you know, from a next level point of view is uh, in order to actually quickly react, we need to connect all these together, how identity and devices are connected, how that re leads to what activity somebody is doing in an application, for example, right? All of these needs to be uh, kind of tied together. And, you know, personally, uh, from our past experiences, we, I mean, uh, who were, were in security industry, they would know security uh, used to be an uh, uh, add-on spec to something that you purchase, right? You have a security checklist, you go through that, and, you know, you just, uh, 
meet the requirements. So it, it was always like a non-functional requirements. Where I see is uh, we are seeing customers moving to more a uh, building uh, security as a functional use case. Like when you're building, uh, let's say you're procuring an ERP, you would say, okay, as a invoice creator, I should do this, 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 and you know you can get access to. What we are seeing is uh, uh, some of the successful organizations they're going to more a use case driven flow for even security. They create those personas saying, okay, I'm a bad actor. When I do this, it should not be allowed. I am a legitimate user, then it should still prompt me for multi-factor authentication or things like that, right? When you align it to a more a user journey driven experience, you get the full value and understanding of where things are and how you are protecting them. And that also sometimes helps you to sell security to the board, right? Because you're, you're telling a more compelling story than just saying that okay uh, you know uh, 512 uh, uh, bit encryption is not good enough we have to move to 1024 right so it, it's more a more a uh, 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 understandable conversation from a board level uh, uh, perspective so i think that's that's what i uh, i've basically seen in the market and you know that's where most organizations are going and trying to establish that zero trust security model uh, uh, so, you know, you at least have centralized visibility, you have control, you have uh, ways to immediately mitigate something um, apart from the design uh, phase, right? Like there is security by design, especially in IT where, you know, you could move uh, security right early on to the design phase. Apart from that piece, you're really looking at having kind of like a zero trust control uh, to your organization. Okay. Thank you very much for your insight on how to keep the visibility in the phase of transition. And uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, cybersecurity, it's the same like, uh, you know, uh, that physical security. You, you, you have most of your data in the cloud at this time. So you have to be very, very careful about the security of your data. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, as uh, if I give you an example, uh, recently, even it's happening now, I'm in the apparel industry and we are exporting a lot of goods to, you know, Europe and USA. Uh, one of the forwarders we are working with, uh, it's, a, it's a very known and reputed uh, forwarder. Their system is being cyber attack at the moment. So we are having issues of booking the shipments and, you know, it affects the uh, movement of cargo. So it's... it's uh, if we talk about the magnitude, it's, uh, it could cost, you know, the buyers and the, the companies a lot of, uh, lot of money to mitigate this issue. So with that, I would like to uh, give you a shared question to both of you. Uh, what are the best practices when developing a risk-based cybersecurity system? So I think uh, Mr. Dharmadi will go first and Mr. Menon will follow. Yeah, okay. So uh, like the main scale, yeah, I think if we are talking about the risk base, yeah, it's back to what is the impact to your company, to your enterprise, if, for example, you get a cybersecurity attack. So uh, if we are talking uh, from the risk space, I think we should talk from the impact. Uh, it could be different enterprise by enterprise, yeah? company by company, like uh, you mentioned this year. For us, for example, we are an uh, automotive company. Yeah? And in our uh, automotive company, we have a manufacturing, we have a factory, we have a retail sales and distribution. We have a logistic. Yeah, we have uh, our value chain, for example, the dealer and also our customer. Yeah, so uh, there's a, a complete flow process. Yeah, so when we are talking about the uh, moving to the clouds, yeah, which part of your data yeah, that you will put first in the cloud? So everybody, uh, I think, must uh, thinking that the most less confidentiality, yeah, the the most uh, the less impact uh, to our uh, operation to our enterprise, yeah, we put it first. 
that's uh, everybody will think about that. Yeah. So if we are talking in us, yeah, if we are put, uh, for example, the manufacturing, the factory data on the cloud, yeah, if something happened, what the, the, the risk, yeah, the impact to us, yeah, for example, our manufacturing stop, yeah, cannot uh, operate. How long? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, could be one day, yeah, two day, one month, or even worse. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, so the impact is to our, uh, of course, our profitability. Yeah, at the end, will impact to the company profitability. Yeah, we cannot uh, sell the car for one month, for example. So that's the biggest impact. Yeah, if we are put, uh, for example, our manufacturer data uh, on the cloud and it's get a hack yeah, by somebody. Yeah. The, the others, for example, if we are put what? For example, we have also the demand supply data. Yeah? So the, the demand supply, the request from the customer, from the dealer that uh, come to us, yeah? then uh, we send the, 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 the demand data to manufacturer, then the manufacturer will get back to the distribution, yeah? how many vehicles that they can uh, produce yeah, in a month, for example. Yeah. If we are put the data uh, on cloud and if something happened, what is the risk for us? Yeah, what is the impact to us? Yeah. So at least yeah, the distribution data, uh, the demand supply data, yeah, we cannot utilize the data yeah, for uh, temporary. Uh, for back again, we don't know one day, one month, yeah, but from, for example, from uh, our point of view, it's better for us to uh, get lost, for example, yeah, the, the demand supply data rather than the manufacturing data. Yeah? Because if uh, our manufacturing data get hacked, the impact might be uh, bigger than if we are lost another data, yeah? for, uh, logistic data, demand supply data. So based on that risk, yeah, what is the impact then? We can calculate, we can prioritize actually which kind of the data that you want uh, on the cloud. Yeah, that's uh, if we are talking about the uh, risk base. Yeah, but uh, if we are talking after you uh, choose the priority, you know the impact. Yeah, of course, before you take a decisions, you should. Uh, ensure that all the security, yeah, you have a uh, feasibility. Uh, many of uh, enterprise, yeah, not not enterprise, yeah. For me, yeah, for example, the CIO, yeah. Uh, Sometimes uh, many of uh, our BOD yeah, ask me, yeah, how secure is your environment? Not only on the cloud, yeah, but is uh, on premise. How can you ensure? You have an on premise, and on, now you have an on cloud environment. The question is very simple. How secure is it? Uh, the question is very short, simple, but sometimes quite difficult to answer. Yeah. So I think, from my perspective, the visualization, yeah, the posture now, uh, cloud security posture is become a uh, common thing. Yeah. Uh, in yeah in the it yeah so if you uh, have a cloud environment you should have a cloud security posture yeah that's a kind of the dashboard yeah which in the dashboard in one dashboard in one screen yeah you can see actually how secure you are how comply you are to uh, the i am many compliance like an nist for example yeah so uh, before you are decide what kind of the data you put in the cloud based on the risk and the impact. Before that, you should uh, ensure that uh, you are cloud security actually already secure using the cloud security posture. So cloud security posture, I think it should become our uh, such kind of daily visualizations yeah, to monitor uh, the security in our cloud. I think like that. 
Thank you. And I would also like to have the insights of Mr. Menon uh, on that question. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I think, I think uh, uh, Mark Dharmadi mentioned a very valid point. I think posture management is a very critical aspect. Uh, you need that visibility. Uh, so that is, that is, I think, one of the key aspects which is developed very well. Uh, I would say from a market maturity point of view, it's, it's developing quite fast uh, as well. Um, uh, from a purely from a security risk standpoint, right? I think uh, I agree to Pak uh, uh, Madi around, you know, first of all, you need to weigh in your risk in terms of impact. Uh, so is it a reputational risk? Is it a regulatory risk? Is it, a, you know, a, a, a bottom line risk and so on and so forth, right? So we'll basically have to identify and provide a, a mitigation a rule book uh, in a way, right? So we, we need to have a mitigation playbook, uh, so to speak. Uh, that's the first thing probably uh, somebody would establish uh, to, to get make sure that we are actually achieving the goals in the right priority. And secondly, once you have that prioritized, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, set of uh, things you want to do from a security risk mitigation point of view, you would look at a couple of things, I think, from a best practices point of view, I think, like I mentioned, you need the building blocks, like you need a strong authentication mechanism, you need like MFA, you can't deny that MFA is uh, uh, you know, required, right? It's, it's absolutely required. And, you know, things like uh, having a single identity solution, uh, so, a single device strategy and so on and so forth would add up, right? So there's a building block layer, which you need to establish. Secondly, uh, especially when it comes to purchase of newer software, we have to assume cloud when we're purchasing newer products, even though they are probably deployed on-prem for functional reasons, deployment purposes, and so on and so forth, we have to assume cloud uh, in a way. And then also from a, uh, like in a SaaS world, uh, what we see is that uh, customers should be pushing for uh, security compliance requirements from those vendors, right? Like SOC2 type two or things like that, that, you know, you could actually drive that security model upfront and make sure that whatever uh, levels of compliance you need is also handled by the underlying organization. Like if you're ISO 27001, uh, when somebody is offering you a SaaS service, if they are not ISO 27001, that, that actually means that you're starting to already put a lot of risk mitigation controls yourself which may overburden the whole value that vendor is bringing to you sometimes, right? So you need to be kind of very sure about what kind of security compliances you would as an organization want and how the downstream sub processors, so to speak, are actually complying to that. Like uh, uh, that's, that's one of the experience as a SaaS vendor myself, we see that, you know, very, uh, that demand is always there, right? That we, we have to raise the bar. Uh, sometimes we have to go aggressively comply to things which is not still relevant in the industry, but it, it is going to happen, right? So because, because customers do need to meet those levels of uh, compliance uh, in the first place. So I think that's, that's my, I would say, uh, kind of like a best practice, have the basic building blocks, make sure purchase process in, you know, assumes cloud and puts all the requirement in place. And then uh, third is really, uh, you know, demand your vendors to actually, you know, be uh, compliant to that level, basically. Okay, thank you very much. And we are running out of time, unfortunately. This could have been one hour, I guess. <laughs> but we are running out of time, so we have to wrap, wrap it up. Uh, and I thank all the participants to this uh, summit, as well as our two speakers, Mr. Menon and Mr. Dharmadi. And uh, basically, uh, as a nutshell, like in a nutshell, we, we have discussed about the major concerns about uh, when we are adopting the cloud technology and also how to overcome losing visibility in the face of transition, as well as what are the best practices when you are developing a risk-based uh, clouds or cybersecurity system. So I think it was a productive discussion and I thank everybody and over to you, Nikita. I think uh, we are done here now. Thanks, Anirudha. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic thank you, session, gentlemen. Fantastic. And thank you so much for your life advices. Yeah. Absolutely going to implement them as soon as the session ends. A big round of applause. And I would request uh, you fine gentlemen to kindly applaud yourselves along with us. A big round of applause. Yeah.